Hi everyone, I hope you're having a wonderful week. I'm actually uh, reaching out to you from uh, the beautiful Turks and Caicos after I've been in New York for the last two months. The last few episodes, uh, we've been covering what's been going on in the Indian uh, tech sector and it's been extraordinary to hear of all the innovation, some of which frankly is ahead of what we see in the West and in the US, which has been very enlightening and surprising. Uh, this week, we're going back in a way to our regular, regularly scheduled programming with uh, more unicorn founder guests. And this week, we have the privilege of being joined by Oscar Hartman, who's been a, um, I guess, unicorn collector and creator over, over the years. And he's going to come here and share with us uh, all of the learnings he's had over the last, you know, over two decades of experience in the category. So without any further ado, let's get started. Welcome to episode 40, Oscar Hartman. Unicorn Accumulator. So, Oscar, welcome to the show. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you very much for this. So why don't we start with just you giving a little bit of background on, you know, who you are and uh, your, 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 your unicorn story. <laughs> my unicorn. So I'm German, uh, born in Kazakhstan and grew up in Germany and moved a lot in my life, more than 30 times by the age I was 30 and lived in the U.S. in 99 where I discovered internet businesses for the first time. So when I moved back to Germany, I started to try to replicate some of the success stories I saw in the US, Starbucks and bodybuilding.com, online shops. So that were my first businesses that I founded during school. And uh, that basically became a theme throughout my life. So one of the key kind of ideas is that everything that works somewhere will work everywhere. That's like one of the things I believed. And so I was doing a lot of business transfer entrepreneurship to new markets. Um, and I was very lucky. So basically, the, after university, the first 10, I was always building a company and investing in the same business model in other geographies. So I was only investing in the business models, which I knew extremely well. And since I created 10 companies myself, uh, basically, I invested in 10 different business models and ended up making 75. Wait, wait. So basically, just so we're clear, you find a business model you like, uh, you build that business yes. model, I guess, typically in Germany, and then in the rest of the world, you then invest in that business model because you have expertise. Yes, you have expertise, you like the business model, you you like the founder, and then it's if, if you know the fa if you like the founder and you like the business model, it's not that important to know the market that well, right? It's the risk you have to take take risk somewhere. So basically, you take the market risk and you just say, look, okay, the population of India is very large. So this, I mean, it, it could work, it could not work, but uh, you, we might as well try, right? But I was only investing in business models where I, that I know very well, and this the reason is also that you you have almost no money, right? So you have to add some value. So when you start business angel investing, uh, you have maybe tens of thousands of dollars or hundred thousands of dollars. And it's very difficult to get into deals unless you can say, look, I was building the same thing. I know what you do. I know, you know, I can add value at the, most of the times people ask me to join the board. And so I could get a bigger stake. I guess, for small am amounts of money. And it was also easier decision for me. I didn't have to screen. I didn't have, a, when I was building companies, I didn't have time to screen thousands of companies, right? So it was basically, I'm, I met the entrepreneurs who do the same thing as me, mostly on conferences. And then I asked them if I can invest. And that and that strategy worked, uh, worked remarkably well, right? So out of 75 investments, uh, basically I got, 10 unicorns, 10 unicorn companies that from seed stage, basically from very early stage. And that was very successful. And uh, basically, I continued with this strategy after that, but more being a business angel saying, uh, but it was the same approach. I was thinking, which business would, would I, you know, like to build and then, but not building it and just investing, right? Just investing. So 
Uh, that's that's the, the approach I use at the moment. But I only I only invest in businesses which I would like to build. So, so let's take a step back. Uh, what's the time. first business model you picked, and why a year, and uh, how did that go? Yeah, that was uh, the, the first business model I picked was. I was a child. I was 17 years old. So I picked the the. It was not like an MBA Harvard approach. It was like uh, I saw what I liked. I liked bodybuilding. So I saw bodybuilding.com and there was no online shop for bodybuilding products in Germany. So I created Pro Fitness Shop, which was a way for anybody in the village. You know, Germany yeah. has a lot of population in villages. There's no way to buy creatine, protein, L-carnitine. So and that that business I built out of school, and basically it became uh, it became a cash cash cow. I was making like twenty thousand dollars a month, which was making me very proud. And it was my, my first success experience where I could like work one month, and then I could afford an expensive vacation. And, and, and what um, what year was that? In, or what years did that cover? When you were seventeen? That was. That was 2000, but I, I didn't know, like I built my first business from 2000 mm. to 2003. And I didn't know, I was in business, I didn't know that there was, mm. the bubble was bursting. I was not reading news. I was just like trying to make a living. I was just trying to build something. I was not aware at all that there was a tech bubble, that it burst, that it was the worst time in history for for internet companies. I was just busy, you know, running my thing and I was doing everything myself. Uh, and it was, uh, so later I found out that what I basically built my first business during the biggest crisis uh, of internet in history, but I did, never tried to raise money. I never, I, I was just- Did, did you read uh, Tim Ferriss' 4-Hour right? Workweek? Because it's actually funny that the one idea he recommends you go build at that time when he first published the book was like selling vitamins online uh, because you can outsource most of the work, you could be as a one-man shop and make it very profitably. So I guess I followed that recommendation, yeah. And then, but when I finished, but then I decided to go to university I sold my business and then I was so smart. So when I was after university, when I was choosing a business model, it took me a very long time because I was analyzing all the options. I had like a huge spreadsheet of hundreds of business models and I was quite frankly confused uh, and couldn't make a decision. So I said, the only reason I made a decision, I set myself a deadline. I said, I'm turning 25 years old. If 14th of May, that's the deadline. I have to make a decision no matter what. It's like it doesn't matter. Uh, and that's what happened. I, exactly on 14th of May, I just like uh, had to decide. And I the, back then there was the shopping club business model, the flash sale, e-commerce business model. So I started uh, to build that. And that was a very fast growing business model, right? The flash sales allows you to grow incredibly fast because you don't have to plan the sourcing to buy the product in advance. So the company grew from from zero to $250 million in sales in, in just, four just, years. Um, yeah. And so we're talking, and what, 2005, more or less? Yeah, so that's like 2008, 2012. 2012. Okay, and, and right? that was just after, so for, I, for those I, viewers who yeah. don't remember, you know, by flash sales, we mean the French side like Vent Privé or the U.S. side that was Gilt uh, or Prevalia or companies like that. And fab.com, which was using the same model, but for furniture and everything design. And that also was the first unicorn, basically, where I became a shareholder. Fab.com was valued then 1.5 billion. But I was investing in uh, sugar.com in, in the Middle East, uh, then in Germany, in India, fashion and you. So all these investments, then sugar was acquired by Souk and Souk was uh, subset, then acquired by Amazon, which became the Amazon of Middle East. Uh, Fab.com I sold very successfully and, uh, and fashion and you, I also sold my stake to one of the VCs. Wait, 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 so take, take what, what was the name of your company flash. and which geography did you operate in? It was... Okay, so you were, okay, so you're doing flash sales in in the Russian market, uh, grew from zero to 250 million revenues in four years. Uh, by the way, what was it like operating in the Russian market back then in like the late 2000s? I mean, it, 
it was uh, Russia was booming all the way up to the financial crisis. So I built my first business during the dot com crash, and I finished university right at the financial meltdown of 2008. So basically, actually, the day I, the day I had my first sale was the day when the Lehman Brothers story uh, happened and I came home and my wife was like, did you see the world is going da- under? And I'm like, look, I just made my first 50 sales in one day. I'm very happy, <laughs> you know? So basically, yeah, the, the, it was it was wild because uh, Russia was in hyper growth all the way up until 2008. And it was an, a, it was an atmosphere of uh, basically everything will work. Everything is going to improve. It's going to be life is going to be so much better in 10 years. It was very optimistic. It was very entrepreneurial. It was super. It yeah. was a little bit like Dubai is now, you know, it's like everybody uh, believes that the future will be better. And that was it was a good environment. And obviously, then the financial crisis happened. It changed a lot of things. But being in e-commerce back then, e-commerce yeah. was so tiny, right? It was like when we back now, e-commerce was so small in 2008. It was like compared to what it is now. It, but it was very predictable that it like it was 100 percent predictable that that what happened will happen. You know, like it was it was clear from the trend line. So we were building e-commerce and uh, my I, I was very quick to create the second company, which was the Zappos business model, Zapato. Uh, wait, 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 the, the, the Zappos was model you the, created while you were building the QPVIP or afterwards from a sequential perspective or? It was, it was a little bit uh, in, in this, like mm. 2010, I, 2008, I created the flash sales model and 2010, two years later, I wanted to create the full price model inside yeah. the flash sales, but the board the advisory board rejected that idea and they asked me to put this idea uh, separately because back then there was a big, like fab.com was moving to to full price and to full assortment, like yeah. the Amazon of design. And there was a big discussion, is that needed? Will there, is there a future for the flash sales model or not? And uh, my board decided that the company should be separate. And so it, it was a separate company with the Zappos business model selling only shoes and only full price, the new collections. Uh, and that company was acquired very fast. It was like uh, 16 months old. And then uh, the, the Amazon acquired Zappos. And when Amazon acquired Zappos, the Russian Amazon, Ozone, said, who is doing Zappos in Russia? Uh, and following the m a strategy of Amazon, acquired my company, Zapato, and it was like a $75 million deal. And I got uh, 3%, almost 3% of Ozone as part uh, of Wait, let's pause here for, for a second, because there, I think there are a lot of interesting lessons already along the way here, in the sense that... I. How did the private sales business, like um, flash sales business, end up playing out? Like, because if I'm not mistaken, most of them kind of went under, or you know, the guild.com, fat.com, etc. Um, and yet, somehow, you succeed, you successfully made money out of these transactions. So, it'd be interesting to hear a what happened to the business, b how you navigated, and made sure you made money. And like, I think fat.com went from 1.5 billion to zero in value in six months. And how you managed to make money out of that. It and was, then we can talk about like ozone and, you know, I think what you called your $300 million mistake. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the flash sales ended uh, badly. The, the business model basically at the end was not scalable to the same level as e-commerce, broad e-commerce. So most of the flash sales, they grew very fast 200 million turnover or 200 or like whatever the market size was and then there was basically a plateau for almost everybody there's like some constraint in mm. the business model because you cannot you don't have reliable inventory you have ever changing inventory and uh, also the e- the broad e-commerce was growing very fast and it was also price competitive so uh, most it was already clear to me in 2010 11 that this business model will be limited and we have to be much broader. So I wanted I wanted yeah. to create full price. I wanted to create different vehicles. So I, I opened uh, the uh, the G, GSI commerce, the, the services business model, where we were opening shops for other brands. Uh, and that became successful and profitable. And I, I started opening a lot of... Did, did you sell QPVIP or what happened to QPVIP? 
I, I sold most of my stake by 2017. Then the company mm. was acquired by Yandex, and then again thrown out by Yandex, and it ended basically it, now. Is, is Von Privé no doing okay still in France but, uh, or Privalia in, in the rest of Europe, or is the category dead, dead? I mean, uh, no, Von, von Privé is just was for a very long time the biggest e-commerce company, basically. And that gives you traffic. Mm. And when you have so much traffic, they started to do travel and it started to be much broader. And they have a very strong core business model. They were always profitable. And I think, but Showroom Privé, after they went public in France, they, 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 the stock crashed very much. So this business model, there's only a few yeah. exceptions. The ones that pivoted, right, like Snap Deal in India, they, tra they transformed the business okay. to something else. and. Uh, Groupon basically killed yeah. the business model finally when the, the Groupon yeah. crash happened, right? Like it was like this fastest company ever to go to 1 billion and then kind of yeah. there were like 50,000 copycats in the world and that and, and that and yeah. there were like 99.99% of them died and that basically... Okay, so it's a good way to get started to get scale, but then you need to find a better business model. And that was also the problem at Fab. Fab grew extremely fast to 100 million and then got extreme high valuation and pressure to grow further. But I already knew that the, the flash sale will mm -hmm. not scale that far, right? So I had like a little bit of insider knowledge and I, I, I thought that uh, the, the average order value is very low and they were offering free worldwide delivery and things like that. So the unit economics was really bad. So for that reason, I decided when they were valued at 1.5 billion, I had the buyer come into my office. The, the company was so hot. I had the guy fly to me, come to my office and he came like with a pipa and he said, I want to make a deal right now, like right here, right now. And he offered me uh, 650 million valuation, so mm -hmm. more than a 50% discount. Uh, and I accepted. Good for you. I accepted and I sold. And, and you sold 100% yeah, or yeah, you so kept some because you never know? Yes. I sold wow. 100% and I actually offered everybody uh, mm. I knew to, to sell with me, but nobody accepted my the same conditions as I accepted. So only me and the founder, Jason, got some cash out as part of the deal. So it was two people yeah, who made money from that. Transaction. One of the lessons you tell me in secondaries is the point of maximum secondary liquidity is when you don't want to sell. And this is a counter example. This is the point of yeah. maximum secondary liquidity in fab and you did want to sell. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. But it's like <laughs> childhood trauma, right? And I, I could have been wrong. I could have been wrong. Uh, because, I mean, the, 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 the idea yeah. was to build the Amazon for design. The vision was extremely yeah. big. The business plan was extremely ambitious. But what happened, that the yeah. sales completely plateaued and the market yeah. went up like fourfold. And that basically yeah. killed the company very quickly. And unfortunately, yeah, I think it could have. But when the business model stopped working, they still had 300 yeah. million and cash accounts. But that, but that was a, a, an opposite example of my point that sometimes you have these companies go into like hype mode and then you have uh, so much liquidity for your shares, secondary, and uh, oftentimes it's a bad timing to sell. When you have the, when we, when you have the maximum liquidity, sometimes, uh, you know, like in auto, like I had this childhood trauma uh, and it, because I really, I was still hope yeah. that the, the company would do well. Like, please, I have to tell you how emotional I was. I was feeling so bad about the uh, failure of fab.com that I donated most of the money that I yeah. made to charity. So I, I was just, I, I had the idea that it's not yeah. good to make money from a failing company to be successful. So I donated a large portion of it wow. for a scholarship program for talented people. First of all, uh, congratulations but, on yeah, the exit. Then, also, uh, congratulations yeah. on, you know, on, on, on being so generous and, and, and helping the people out there. And, and we have actually many people in the chat that are <laughs> commending you. Uh, we have Jimmy Eges uh, saying congrats on like the analysis of the markets and the timely exits. Mishpa saying great exit, Oscar. Uh, and uh, actually we have a question from uh, one of the oh, viewers. Oh, Ravi oh, is asking, what's the best way to pitch you a startup? 
Yeah, it's to Telegram. No, no, but I guess how do they get re- Telegram? How do they reach you? Uh, is it like LinkedIn or do you have a website or? I, the best way, I think the best way is always an introduction. Uh, I know so many people. I think I have 25,000 contacts <laughs> in my phone. So there's a lot of people who can introduce. I'm very social. So there's a lot of people uh, that can introduce you to me. And I'm looking now, I'm looking at a lot of investments, obviously. Um, I, and I think the best way is to do an introduction. If that doesn't work, I guess you can mm-hmm. try cold via LinkedIn or okay. email or whatever. But uh, my sure. contacts are all So, okay. So the second, the second big or well, third big company you're building is the Zappos, uh, which you sell to Ozone. So you call Ozone your $300 million mistake. Can you, can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, that, I think that's an amazing story, right? The, the the Russian Amazon. So I got I became a shareholder because the the deal was half cash, half shares, and uh, and, and, the, and the company w- was having a very hard time because Russia was cash on delivery. Uh, Russia had a lot of uh, it was very expensive logistics for the small average order values, and it was very challenging. The company was always uh, the same as Amazon company was never but it didn't have the access to capital as amazon right so it was always struggling from round to round uh and then by 2018 uh the company was 20 years old the company was tw- you can even imagine the founder had left company like 15 years ago the, the original founder right it, it had changed several times in owners so there was about so it, there was no founder in place uh, it was basically venture capital private equity owned uh, and it was not growing for several years and highly unprofitable with broken unit economics. And I just, I just, you know, and then a new guy came in who wanted to buy up a lot of the shares and I sold my shares at a very low valuation. It was about a hundred million valuation, right? And they, they brought in a new CEO who was not a founder, but who was a hired CEO. He got incentivized with shares. But I just could not imagine a scenario where a company, after struggling for 20 years, and I was an insider, I knew the industry, I knew all the competitors, I knew everything. And I just couldn't think of a scenario where you would have a manager come in and turn the company around as much as he did. Like 36 months later, the company was valued 12 billion. It was like the more credible turnaround i have ever witnessed it was like it, it, it was unbelievable the alexander the ceo he's a, he's a star he's he's a, he was a cto before so he came from technical background and basically i sold my shares and 36 months later the company went public and was valued 12 billion <laughs> that's really impressive how much are they worth today uh, now nobody knows how much they were, right? Their, stock, oh, their okay. shares are blocked. So uh, I, think, I think the official mm. market cap is 2.5, uh, but yeah. it's not it's not a fair price or a real price. Uh, so I guess it, it, it was mm. a small window of opportunity to, uh, but it was incredible story actually. Then, you know, the strategy that led to the turnaround was going back to the Amazon basics, right? So Alexander came in and he said, Whatever we are doing that Amazon is yeah. not doing, we will stop. We will stop doing everything. And whatever Amazon is doing that we are <laughs> not doing, we will start doing. And so he, he opened the marketplace. Yeah, Amazon model. Prime, he opened uh, everything that, uh, Marketplace. And, and the company. Yes, and the company. So, so okay, so the, then um, you sell the Zappos site business model to Ozone. What's the next business model you, you get to? And in what year, more or less? Yes, and then there was uh, the, the I got pitched by a German entrepreneur, like immigrant. Uh, I like to invest in immigrants because I, I was an immigrant all my life myself. Uh, and he was he was he saw Aramis after in France, uh, which was which is not a big company. It's like it, it, I think it was a 150 million euro company, which is doing uh, used car trading and uh, buying. And they wanted to do the same in Germany, and that company became out of one at the end, right? So I was I was their first investor. I gave them uh, I gave them the first money to start to start working, 
uh, and out of one became so fast growing that I was just like, I was so impressed. It was like on month 12, they were doing 1 million a month. And then on month, on month 24, they were doing 10 million per month. It was like, it, it, it was like insane, you know? Uh, and I asked them what their international strategy was. If they, and they said, we will focus on Europe. We will focus on Europe. So I asked for their permission. I said, can I invest in other countries? Uh, for the same business model, and they, they said, "Okay, it's fine." Actually, we yeah. looked at some investments together. No, no, uh, I'm the I'm the idiot who passed then, on other one at the seed up. because the the valuation was like 24 million. I thought it was too expensive relative to traction. I think, and and so, or the A, one yes. of those two rounds. Oops. I have a great story on valuation, Fabri. So. Hakan was pitching me a four point. I, I was investing two hundred thousand euros, and he was pitching me. Uh, to, mm -hmm. to get five percent, right? So it was like uh, almost a five million valuation. So I thought that's very high because it was pre-seed. Yeah, yeah. It was pre. It was. Uh, they didn't have a PowerPoint. So I said, look, Hakan, I think five million is too much. I think it should be three million because three million back then was the the the, the seed valuation. And then he told me, look, Oscar, if I agree to three million. That's a 40% uh, discount. Uh, that means you have invested in an entrepreneur who loses in negotiations 40% of the value. So that means you're investing in a guy. He, in every round in the future, he will make compromises. He will uh, lose value. Do you really want to invest in an entrepreneur who is so bad at negotiations? So I said, no, I don't. And I, I invested. The Good five. for you. Okay. So then you're like, I like this model. They're only doing Europe. I want to do the rest of the world. So did you build it? Did you invest in it? And which geographies did you end up doing? Yeah. So I made a, a map of the world with like five factors that influence this business model. And then there was a rating. Japan was first. And then like US was out of question. Um, and a lot of uh, a lot of the countries, yes. Yeah, so the, by then we did uh, Dubai for the Middle East, which became sell any cars, also extraordinary successful. It's not a unicorn yet, but I think it's on the way. Uh, then I ended up investing in Cars 24 in India mm -hmm. and also Spinny, uh, which was on your channel recently. Um, and uh, I was investing in all kinds of weird countries like, you know, Nigeria and Pakistan and Mexico, uh, Brazil, Instagram. Yeah, we did that one together. I think we I, did it together. may still play out well, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, and, um, and then I looked at Japan and nobody was, there was nobody in Japan doing this business model. Uh, which was the live auction. It, it became completely different from Aramis after. It became like you, you auction yeah. the car before you buy it, right? You don't buy cars. You auction them off like instantly, live auction. And nobody was doing that model in Japan. So I moved to Japan. I moved to Tokyo. And I built, uh, the, I built this business model in Japan uh, from zero. Then we raised money from uh, Mitsui, then Rakuten invested, eventually acquired the company in Japan. So I had this experience of building a company in Japan from zero. Yeah. It was not a success, Fabrice. That was car price, right? Very tough. I, 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 yeah, that, I, I, we were was, investors in that. It was with car you. price <laughs> Japan. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, we yeah. barely made our money back in Japan, but at right. least uh, the company is now under... Very hard for Gaijin's to like, succeed uh, in Japan. I mean, what, what did you learn about doing business in Japan? Yeah. Actually, Jimmy just asked the question um, <laughs> on the, on the, on the chat. I, I, I thought that the, the, the startup environment is very tough for startups because the culture is not very welcoming for new, for new things. People like to do the things the, mm -hmm. the way they were done, right? So... Uh, nobody's customers are very difficult to switch over. It's a very high acquisition cost and it's very difficult to do B2B. You have experience like you just want to buy phones and the companies will not deliver you phones because your company is less than three years old, right? They would just not, not make, not sign a contract. And it was very difficult to get an office. So I called my friend who was head of international at WeWork 
like in order to get an office in Japan, you needed two signatures of people who who give full guarantees. The rent will be paid for 12 months at least. So two people have to guarantee, two local Japanese people, that if the startup fails, they will pay 12 yeah, months completely rent crazy. forward, right? And, and did you and speak I, Japanese? I called... No, I didn't speak. Oh, I was speaking English all the way. But I had Japanese co-founders, three co-founders, Japanese, which were very strong. So I, I didn't have any illusions that I will build this business for a long time. So it, it became eventually. And, 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 so what do you think of the Auto One business model? Yeah, but, Is it working, or are there are the unit economics working? Is Auto One doing well, or? Yeah, I think uh, that. I mean, it, Auto One at its peak was again twelve billion. So it became a decacorn, not even a unicorn. Uh, Frontier Car Group was sold uh, to Naspers, and Cars24 became very successful. In and, India. and you were an investor Speedy in Frontier Car Group as well? In India, but that, yeah, I was an investor in Frontier as well, yes. Um, and the business model, uh, is it works very well. The question is, how much is it worth? Like at the, uh, when it was valued, you know, four times GMV, it was probably too much. But now when it's valued like 20% of GMV, it's probably too low. And then Carvana happened, Carvana went to 50 billion. And everybody started to build the Amazon for cars, yeah. the Carvana business model, which was made most money from, from used car credit. Correct. Right? It was not making money from trade much. Uh, not, and everybody was saying that the out of one business model is outdated and the Carvana business model is, is now the thing to be. Uh, but then Carvana crashed from 50 billion to, I think, 3 billion or whatever it is now. And and, and now the question marks are very big. So the, the, the main question mark, Fabrice, is what is the OEM's position for the car market of the future? And the OEMs have not decided themselves, right? Uh, will all, all AMs go to the Tesla model, yeah. direct to consumer, and lock customers in, or will there be still uh, a, a role for dealers, for other people in the supply chain? That is the main but, question. For multiple questions for you. Um, one, one question for Constantine: How much time do you give a company to validate the business model, to make sure the unit economics work, to make sure that there's a business there, or and and does it even matter? I mean, it feels like. Ozone, it didn't work for 20 years or, you know, the fab.com, it never kind of worked and you still can make a lot of money because you can grow quickly. And there's always these miracles, you know, I call them miracle exits sometimes. So it happens, you know, but I me, my opinion is year seven, year seven. If you are not on good track to become profitable by year seven, it's becoming a pain it's becoming a big problem uh, usually right if you for most market i invest a lot in marketplace business models like you if you expect uh, you know you get so much more value for yeah. free once you're big your first priority should be to become big right like you, once you're big people just bring you more and more money you just get so much value uh so it's it's, it's a mistake to try to fix the unit economics too much in the first three years four years uh, the goal is to become big as fast as possible. Unfortunately, because that's where you burn a lot of money, right? Like I burned so much money in marketplaces where you try to get to the scale, but it doesn't work. So I, I would say I'm very patient, but I do want to see positive unit economics quite early before massive investments. And I, I do think that companies should strive to become profitable by year seven or eight. I think that's that's a good target. For um, point other question. Point. So other one, you're like absolutely not in the U.S. So why was that? I mean, it's very there's been actually a fair amount of examples of ideas from Europe brought to the U.S. that works. But this one, you're like, no, it's not going to work. Well, Auto one came to the U.S. It did the market uh, exit, but it was similar to Japan. Uh, it was similar to the, the thing that we didn't, that we underestimated in Japan and in the U.S. That there's already an offline mm. marketplace. In Japan, it was U.S.S. and in 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 America, yep. it's Mannheim Group. And and, and these offline uh, marketplaces, they seem so ineffective because you have to bring the car there to park it, to move it, and all these things that you don't have to do in digital. But because they have liquidity. 
these these companies have so much liquidity. Mannheim is a 60 billion dollar company. So when you have that much liquidity, people are ready to take. I think you can punch them in the face on the entrance to Mannheim, and they will still come. Like they will still go, even if you punch in, every. Single yeah, in marketplaces, in liquidity face, trumps everything else, go. and so the existence of offline B two B markets that were liquid and worked obviously meant that you didn't really need an online one yeah ma makes a lot of sense okay so you then exited those businesses you sold them uh and so that takes us to white ear and what was the next business model yeah so the the next business model was the food delivery <laughs> so basically i i found this uh, startup in a small city in germany uh, Munster. It's a city of 120,000 people, and there was this startup there, delivering everything liquid, so water and uh, whatever is liquid. So, like uh, in Germany, it's called Getränkemarkt. So there's separate grocery mm. and separate liquids stores, uh, and it was doing a 90-minute delivery. So you can order, and they promise to deliver within 90 minutes, and they pick up all the old stuff you have at your house. They pick everything up, and yep. they bring you the new things. And this company, and this company had a market share in Münster of 25 percent. So 25 percent of everything liquid in Münster was delivered by Flash and Post, uh, and it was it was doing one million euro turnover in one little city, and it was do, it was EBITDA profit. Wow, 3 super EBITDA. impressive. And, and which year are we talking about here? We are okay. talking about 2016. And it was from 16 to 17. So I was so impressed by this company. I have never seen, you know, a market. Like in Germany, you have 200 cities like Münster. So it's not very hard to imagine that you take this company from Münster and just re replicate to 200 other cities like Münster. So 1 million times 200 is 200 million, right? It's, and you don't, and you don't have to think work in yeah. India or will this work in Pakistan, right? You, you just... If it worked in Münster, will it work in Freiburg? You know, it's it's a very easy decision. You know, so basically that's why I made my biggest investment in my life. I was so in love with the founder, I was so in love with the performance. So I invested uh, five million euros uh, in this company uh, of personal money, uh, and I bought a, a big stake. Uh, and that and that was basically the start of the quick commerce boom that we saw play out in the last four years right so uh flash and post basically it ha what happened was exactly as predicted they went to 25 cities they saw the same numbers and they didn't even have time to expand to 200 cities because when they showed the same results on 25 cities they were acquired for one billion dollars by dr oetker dr oetker was one of the biggest uh, food producers and specifically beer producers in Germany, and they have a very cash-rich business, and they acquired Flash and Post as a B2C, basically as a direct-to-consumer uh, channel, uh, and and bought the company for one. Wow! Billion, congratulations! Uh, Another rich. amazing exit. And that, Another unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was. Yeah, that was another unicorn, and this was a real unicorn, right? Because it's one billion, yeah, cash. not a share deal, not. Uh, yeah, it was a real, a real exit uh, to a final uh, purchaser who had the vision for the company. But that was the biggest trade sale in the history of Germany, the the, the biggest trade sale for cash, and it triggered like an all-out hype, right? Like uh, then. You had companies like GoPuff in the U.S. Yeah. and then you had Getir in Turkey who developed more organically. And then you had similar to Groupon and similar to the flash sales business model. You had, you had people all over the world started doing uh, what's called instant grocery delivery, like 15 minutes, uh, very quick. Uh, you just press a button and the, and the courier said, so you deliver one order at a time. So it was a new form of e-commerce. You don't do routing. You just deliver one uh, package at a time. I mean, in a, in a way, that makes sense, uh, right? Like, then, the internet has always been about quicker, better, faster. I think the issue here is you had a massive capital war with all these people sort of attacking this category simultaneously. Uh, but do you believe in the long-term viability of the model? I mean, we've seen 
massive retrenchment, right? Like massive people with firings and everyone from Getir to Gopuff to Joker are undergoing massive uh, transformation and restructuring. Or like, do you believe in the model? Is it here to say? Or what's your perspective here? Definitely. So I think the business model is definitely not as good as everybody yeah. was acting in 21. It's not that good because there were literally like $1 billion per month yeah. invested in this business model. It was insane. But it's <laughs> definitely not as bad as everybody is acting right now. Because I think if, if this business model would be a public company, it would be down 98%. It's, to, it's like it's the most <laughs> worst hit ever yeah. business model. Like it was, it's completely bad. You can pitch 400 investors, you will get zero like people going into your data room, no matter what your unit economics are. But I, uh, you know, I made a big uh, mistake on, on Delivery Hero because I saw them very early. And I, back then I said, I was yeah. very focused on AUV. In e-commerce, I thought AUV is the key driver. And they had such a low AUV, I said, this can never work. And then obviously it became a 25. I, I saw the company at 4 million valuation. And I went to their office, I spent time. I, I, I invested a $2 million pre in uh, Delivery Hero at, on a PowerPoint at the very, very, very beginning. Oh. And I kept it. The problem is I kept it also in the last 12 months. <laughs> My shares are down, I don't know, 95% or something ridiculous. So it was like, I mean, obviously, relative to investing at $2 million pre, it's way up. But relative to a $30 billion company... Oh my God, it hurts. I, I had like tens of millions of dollars of shares and it's like, you know, I think I've lost it a million now. <laughs> you know, but it's not, it's not as oh, bad no, as I'm everybody. Very so I think this very business model, you know, make me bullish. Uh, I was invested in this yeah. company in Canada uh, and the guys did a great job and they started charging for delivery. They just started charging yeah. the full cost. It's just like five dollars per delivery, and and the, the the demand didn't go down that much. The demand went down like twenty percent. So I think the free delivery yeah. is a stupid idea. I think when you when you will charge the full operational cost to the customer, there's still gonna be maybe half the market, right? It's, it's gonna be small. It's gonna be a niche market, but it, it's gonna be there for sure. I mean, it's too good. The experience for the consumer is too good it's absolutely crazy just push a button and within sometimes it takes seven minutes it, and you're so delighted uh that for short tail skews it makes so much sense i i to me it, it like falls in line with the future of the internet right the internet to me is faster cheaper better this is all three at the same time it's going to happen maybe it doesn't happen now <laughs> maybe it'll take a while to figure out the unit economics and density and for the competitive dynamics to play out i think the issue you know if you think of flash and posts the reason that they were profitable is there was only one and we go to new york a year ago and we had like nine competitors going after the market all with amazing teams all with money the market didn't support nine competitors because we're one or two and as this plays out in the coming few years, I think we're going to have a massive category. I mean, in the U.S., grocery is $550 billion a year. Do I think this can take a big chunk of that? Absolutely. So I'm actually very bullish, despite the fact that so much cash has been incinerated. And I still hope that there's a, a good outcome here. I'm also bullish, but sometimes in venture you have this effect where one company, be, like WeWork, right? It yeah. crashed an entire industry. Uh, also, uh, like gorillas, you can have yeah. one psycho company and gorilla, uh, gorillas went and showed the market. The, the numbers were so bad that it became like the like, yeah. FT, like FTX is now, FTX. Uh, it's like it, it, it's, yeah, it's it, it becomes like the Enron <laughs> moment, right? Like and uh, But it's not really fair to all the entrepreneurs that were building the companies properly, especially in developing economies. Like you, you have this business model everywhere in Brazil, in Africa, in Thailand, in Indonesia. Yeah. They have completely different unit economics, but they have no chance. You know, look, look I was looking at Delivery Hero versus Just Eat. And Just Eat as like horrible unit economics, uh, not a great company. Delivery Hero, amazing, leader in its four countries, amazing everything. And both are down the same amount. And I'm like... Everything's correlated to one on the way down in food right now, and frankly, in tech writ large, and people are throwing out the baby with the bathwater. It'll come back. It'll take a while, though, <laughs> but it'll come back. 
So I'm still in, I'm, I I invested in ten markets. So I, we are bankrupt in seven out of ten. So Oops. we <laughs> we still have three left. So Japan is still alive. Japan is the biggest convenience market in the world. And now we have the same situation as Flash and Post. It's only one company. Okay, left. so you're 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 left in Japan, Just in Canada, and I guess uh, Flash and Post yes. is all around. No, Canada. Even though they turned the unit economics profitable, but no, none yeah. of the investors cared. Nobody even went to check the data room. It was so Canada is dead. Uh, we're still uh, very successful in Germany with Flink. Flink. So after we sold Flash and Post, uh, we immediately invested in the same business model for groceries. And the company is called Flink, and it, I think it's the fastest growing. It might be the fastest growing company mm. in the history of Germany. Uh, it's. It, it was. I mean, it, it's. It's really. In, it is a fant- and it is a good business. So Flink is doing everything properly, uh, but. They're they're also obviously affected by the market uh, situation. So I'm still I'm still alive in Germany. Unfortunately, the uh, the situation is really. I mean, we are laughing because Fabrice, you and I, we 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 know that failure is part of the game. But for the founders who are inside this, it's a real tragedy, right? So I have the founder in in U- in UK had a heart attack uh, following oh. a failed fundraiser. That's so sad. Uh, the, in India, it's the same. I have- I have a founder in India. Also, two people, two people out of my portfolio, had heart attacks, and I really, I just really hope that entrepreneurs should. I mean, how yeah. I don't, how can you, you know? I, I know it's hard. I was there myself, but somehow you have to, to not take it so personal because this this market downturns. They just yeah, it's not, it's not your fault. Everything's correlated to one on the way up in the in the bubble, and everything's correlated to one on the way down in in the crash. Uh, and yeah, I agree with you. Don't take it personally. Um, a few questions. And in fact, the reason people fail is not usually your fault. It's like you didn't find product market fit, or you fell off with your, your competitor, or you, sorry, your 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 co-founder, or the markets just are bad. Period. It's very rarely, you know, like the one thing you did that killed the company. Um, a few questions from the audience. Uh, Mishma is asking, what are the some unpopular sectors that you're looking to invest in currently? What makes you believe these sectors will be growing in the next 10 to 15 years? Yeah, I think it's it's property tech, right? At the moment, because the interest rates are going up, all investors in the world just said, we will not touch anything with real estate. Uh, but the real estate industry and the construction industry, the entire, it's, it's the biggest industry in the world, right? It's the biggest and it's the least yeah. digitalized, the least digitalized. So I believe that, you know, the $300 trillion of real estate that exists in the world, like 20 or 30% of this real estate is managed yeah. horribly. Like it's, it's, the, it's a complete mismanagement old systems like it's very bad it, everything has to be fixed so i invest in new technologies in like op, i call it operating systems for real estate how do we own and manage portfolios of do you know the estate, companies like right? belong or and mind in the us were... yeah yeah i i know these company I i'm not invested there i, I invested see. in june homes for example which i think is a fantastic company um, and, and, and I just recently invested in the same business model in Australia and the same business model in Europe. And, I just, and these companies are right now, I think, strongly under two things. Yeah. The WeWork mantra, like everybody, everybody, like WeWork was saying, we are a technology company that just happens to do real estate. And then the market said, no, you are just a real estate company. <laughs> You're just a real estate management company, and the real estate management companies are worth three times yeah. EBITDA, and you have no EBITDA, so basically that's it. So I think, that, but the mantra treats a lot mm. of companies unfairly, unfairly, right? There's actually a lot of companies doing this business model profitably, yeah. profitably, uh, and doing it well, and it works. Uh, and at the same time, with the interest rate going up, a lot of uh, property tax are basically killed, and uh, I think it's it's it, it's wrong because not sure. all of them depend on the interest rate. Uh, so I think property I think property technology is one of the most overlooked uh, segments of the of the industry, and I think there's a lot of marketplaces to be built, construction marketplace, construction material marketplaces, and real estate. Just like the way 
uh, for example, the multi-family homes in the U.S., the way they are managed, it's just a bad experience for everybody. Everybody is unhappy. The net promoter score. Yeah, it's because it's like basically your in- all your interactions are offline. People never reply. Getting anything done is really, really hard. Yeah. Uh, two questions from um, uh, Ravi. Are you sector agnostic in your investments? Do you have any preferred sectors? Um, and what is your average check size for seed investments? So I think about sectors, I think uh, I want my portfolio to be a little different from the global economy. Right. If you look at the global economy, there's just like, you know, financial products or financial technologies, banking is the is one of the biggest business models in the world. Right. Like so I definitely invest a lot in fintech. Uh, now I used to be like I said I used to be less smart I was just doing what I saw and not analyzing but now I'm analyzing right so fintech is a big industry and it's it's a big business model you know uh, money is a good product everybody wants money so it's a good product uh, then real estate real estate yeah. is just so big it's too big to ignore uh, and then you have obviously all the retail segments automotive fashion all the big uh, the way the world works, uh, you 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 might, might like it or not. Uh, the only industry that I have a hard time is health technology because I know the the health as a percentage of world GDP is growing very fast. But I have a very hard time to invest in health because it's much dependent on regulators, right? Every country uh, is not different because the people are different, but every country is different because the regulations are different, right? People are the same everywhere, but so I have a hard time in health tech. But but I do not invest in business models where which are too niche, right? Because I invest a lot in developing economies like Nigeria, Kenya, uh, all the countries in the world which have a large population. Uh, and you know, I don't see a point to invest like in a new yoga mat. Uh, no, no, if you're going uh, after a that market makes, that is smaller by default, you might as well go, I mean, the country, you might as well go for a big, big vertical like finance or real estate. That, that makes a lot of sense. So and, what's and your average of, check seed, of, seed size? Of, I'm sorry. Just one, my biggest learning, Fabrice, just sorry. I think one of my biggest learnings as an entrepreneur and investor, and I'm 100% convinced of this, it's absolutely equally difficult to build a huge business and the small business there is no difference in difficulty absolutely at, at all there's no dif- there's no difference in effort i don't know i totally yeah, agree sorry it says hard to build a small business as a big business so might as well go and build a big business a hundred percent agree um so so what's your average uh, check size for seed investments i think in the last five years it was uh, something like 300 okay. 400 thousand dollars yeah but, I, but it's, it's the average. The average, I think I do some high conviction, uh, bigger bets. So in seed stages, I do 100 or okay. 200,000. Uh, what is your secret sauce for success in your investments? Do you plan or do you have a plan on how your legacy and how you want to be remembered by future generations? <laughs> <laughs> I think I only have two secret sauce. The, the first thing I make this... Uh, I think it's all about action and I make decisions very fast. I take risk. That's the, that's the first. The second, believe that, that not, not many people share for some reason. It's, it's, I, I, I keep seeing all these people that don't share this belief. I believe everything that worked in one place will work everywhere. Like if inframarket worked in India, I think the same business model will work in Brazil. I, and most of the time I'm wrong, but 50% of the time I'm right. And but this gives me like infinite opportunities. This belief, this belief gives me so much to do. While a belief that nothing will work. You know, a lot of people, like when you speak to people uh, in Brazil, they say this business model will not work here because we have a gray market and this will not because of that. Uh, it's always everything is different. When you believe everything is different, you find no opportunities. When you believe everything is the same, you find infinite opportunities. Infinite. It's uh, almost like you don't have enough hours in the day. I think you share this belief as well. That's how you made 
900 investments. I think you couldn't have done 900 investments. Absolutely. P- people are the same, right? Like everyone wants to be entertained. Everyone wants to have a sense of purpose. Everyone wants to communicate. And, and that's a true underlying human condition or human need globally. And it doesn't matter if you're in Pakistan or Nigeria or the US or France, you want these things. And so things that have a tendency to work in one country have a tendency to work in the others. Now, of course, there are adaptations and nuances. But yeah, this is the way I built my first few companies like you, right? Like I took ideas from the US, brought them to Europe, brought ideas from Europe and Asia, brought it to the US. And it's no longer the core of what we do. Now we mostly do business model innovation in the US, but it's still a large part, especially when we invest outside of the US. It's mostly adaptations. I wouldn't say copies, adaptations for the local market. So I totally believe that. I mean, as Jimmy Egas said, the quote you use is people are people. And I agree. People are the same everywhere. People are people. And then uh, now I have uh, four unicorns in, in India. And, you know, I don't know India that well. And, and a lot of people are like, how is that even possible? How can you... Ma- how can you have four unicorns while most investors in India, like I think I'm the top five business angel in India, right? And how is that possible? The only advantage I have is that I was one of the few who believed everything will work. In yeah, to- everything. totally agree. Like, uh, and by the way, I'm so <laughs> bullish on India right now. I think they've put in all the infrastructure rails required to make this market very, very big. And so we're, we're all in on India right now. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, I go by population. I think every country with a growing population eventually will figure it out. You know, just, you know, it's a lot of smart people, yeah. a, lot, a big population. I mean, you have to do a lot of mistakes to, to, to mess that one up. So I am also big on India. I'm also big on Africa. You know, of course, U.S. Uh, is is the is the holy grail of entrepreneurship. But in terms of legacy, what I want to leave behind, you know, I dedicated my life. Best ideas in the world spread faster, right? And the, and, and not only in in for profit. I did exactly the same approach approach in non profit. It's amazing how much value you can create if you just look. What are the most successful nonprofits in the world and they mostly work only for one region right and then you create the same for another region and it works you know like i saw there's a company called hand, it's a organization called hand in hand in india they have 10 million women participating and there was a company pro mujer in mexico with the same business model with 2 million women so we created the yeah. same for cis region uh, so I, I, I donate to Promohair and but organizations I, like that as well. So we're very aligned in terms of promoting yeah. micro enterprise and women, female entrepreneurship uh, in, in emerging markets. And I created this organization because there was none to, to give money to. And it, it became the fastest. It's now in 285 cities. It's like 50,000 women. It's unbelievable. And somehow... I became the founder of this women leadership organization, which is a, a, a kind of strange, <laughs> but but somehow these ideas are not spreading themselves, you know, Fabrice. It, I wish the, the good ideas would spread themselves, but you need channels like your uh, Well, that's what entrepreneurs are for, right? right? Like that's we, why I'm on this. We see problems and we see opportunities and we go after them. We fix the problems. We we attack extractive business models, broken user experiences, and we and, and, and we we'll pursue the opportunities presented to us. I mean, that's the core of entrepreneurship, and that's what's been driving human development and economic growth for the last two hundred years. And so, you know, it's founders writ large. Yeah, and that's what also what I love about business angels because there's a global network of business angels, and business angels, unlike VCs, we don't compete at all. Like 60% of your most successful investment will come from your angel network. Fellow angels always introduce you to opportunities. Uh, A a lot of success stories from my portfolio came from my university alumni organization, right? Um, But I think, you know, right now I'm building a club, you know, to just connect all the most successful business angels in the world to be together and to share ideas, to share investment opportunities. I think, you know... There's no competition at all. So business angels are really, really important 
for the global ecosystem of entrepreneurship and everything. And you know, we have been working with you since you know more than ten years. Oh yeah, I know. And how many Countless. ideas have we exchanged? Countless ideas. It's amazing, right? Um, so after the car, yeah. um, sorry, the food businesses. Um, did you are you working in that global group of angels, or is there any business in between, or maybe the real estate businesses, and or it, did we miss anything be, between before we get yeah. to what are you up to right now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I did I did a lot of nonprofit work, Fabrice, but I think your channel is not the the best to discuss <laughs> entrepreneurship development and all this talent leadership. But uh, I think I was. And I am in love with property tech. I did a lot of uh, investments there. And I think at the moment, uh, yeah. new banking, so new ways, credit led, credit led, uh, different. Uh, I mean, I think there's a lot of cons consumers and companies in the world which are very unfairly treated by banks. Uh, and it, I mean, it's still, it's, this opportunity is still so early, right? And you can build a biz you can build such a big business even in small geographies, right? I have right now an investment in Azerbaijan and the company is just on it's so big yeah. because the business model is so big. You can when your when your business model is so big, Absolutely. you can be ba in a very small Absolutely. Banking is 25% country, of GDP right? in most countries. It's huge. Yeah, and you have a new bank in uh, in Brazil, but you don't have it in many other countries. You don't have a good new bank in Vietnam, in Philippines, yeah. in in big countries, but uh, not even to speak about small countries, right? There's a lot, so there's a lot of opportunity there. A lot of industry-specific banks, right? Like a bank just for SaaS companies or a bank for the construction industry. So you basically digitalize an entire industry. You see all the flows. You build a marketplace and then you finance the flows. And this is possible in a lot of different industries, right? Uh, so it, it's difficult. It's a more difficult business model. But I see this also happening uh, all over. But I still invest in, in the automotive. I just mm -hmm. invested in Mintlist, which is the new Auto One in, in the US. So I think there's still a lot of disruption to be done there. Um, yeah, so the, the, these are the moment uh, my favorites. But actually, you know, Fabrice, at the moment I'm so amazed how many good business models yeah. there are. I'm just I'm, I met I think I met 300 entrepreneurs this year, or maybe maybe 700. I don't know how many. Uh, it was one of my most active years. I did 35 investments just this year, and there's just so many beautiful stories. And nobody knows about these stories. Nobody knows about... You, you know, we're, we're, we're at the very beginning of the tech revolution. Uh, when you think world. of, like, most industries, like, they're completely not digitized. It's like sub-1% penetration. Everything, everyone's doing things, pen and paper, no... Bringing all the supply chains online in every industry, in every geography. It, it, we're still day one. I mean, I think we're day zero. Everything needs to be built, both in emerging markets and, frankly, in, in the developed world. Yeah, so I think the same. So I want to, my dream, Fabrice, is to find 50 unicorns in my life. You have already achieved it, so you are one of my few role models left in this world. So I want to finish my life. I want to have 50 unicorns <laughs> like Fabrice uh, and, and 50 unicorns in business. And I also want to have 50 unicorns in life. And life unicorns are like experiences that you will not forget until the end of your life, like a baby being born yeah. or going to the North Pole or this weekend I'm trying to show the Northern Lights to my to my children. Uh, so I want to have this 50 life unicorns and 50 business well, unicorns. To date, what's been companies. the craziest life unicorn you've done or the most interesting or impressive or exceptional or different maybe? Yeah, so I think I have an unhealable sickness which if it, uh, it's called bacterial disease and it it, it, uh, my, it it breaks my back and my back is becoming more and more bent. Uh, so I started, ro I thought if I have a sickness that uh, that bends my back, I have to do a sport that does the opposite. So I started rowing uh, and I started rowing more and more because it was helping relieve my back pain. And I'm good at rowing. And uh, because I was an entrepreneur and investor, I was doing a lot of indoor rowing. 
and then I became uh, top 100 and we became top 100 in the world. I got so excited. So I dedicated an entire year of my life. I lived with the Olympic sports team. I lived one year like a sportsman, like an athlete. I was eating right, sleeping right, training right. And I broke two world records in 2019 uh, in indoor rowing. Uh, and I kind and and I had never back pain since, you know. So I kind of uh, have healed myself from an unhealable sickness by some insane effort in rowing. <laughs> It, it totally sure counts. counts. I mean, as the people in the chat are saying, you're very inspiring. Uh, and this is extraordinary. And, and look, it goes to show the power of grit, determination, ambition. Uh, and it expresses itself in all the facets of life. It expresses itself in entrepreneurship and investing and in the life you lead on a daily basis and overcoming the challenges you face. So, you know, congratulations on, on, on that. It's really impressive. You invite you invited me to a live unicorn walking to the yeah I'm, I'm walking to the, the south I, to the to the south pole in january uh for a few weeks uh pulling my sled and my food and my tent and my etc and i invited you to join i think it would have been super fun yeah so i you know these are live last year also recorded the longest podcast in history <laughs> 60 hours live without sleeping so it was. I broke the world record for the longest podcast. This will not be broken today. Yeah, don't worry, audience. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of endurance, so I can keep going, Fabrice. You just say stop. Uh, or, or, are there are there any topics we didn't cover, or any things we didn't discuss that we should discuss or cover today? You know, I, I think a lot of people always ask me, "What are the, you know, the secret sauce? What is the secret? What is the hidden?" fact uh, or what is the factor to success and I, I think this is a big mistake to think like that I think a lot of people want to be scientific about unicorns and break them down like a Swiss watch what are the elements how do they influence each other but unicorns are not a Swiss watch it's not it's it's too many factors and they're all dynamic and they're all interacting there's too many hidden factors right so uh, if I want to maximize my chance to find the unicorn what I do is I invest in a male founder uh, who finished either Stanford or WHO in Europe, who worked a little bit at Boston Consulting Group, and then created a painkiller company in an existing big market, right? And if I combine all the factors that maximize my chance of success to find the unicorn, all the factors that are known, he was born in a village, he had a dream, and he's amazing. I still have a chance if one to 300, one to 300 is the maximum chance that I can achieve by combining all the known factors that I, that I, so what is the conclusion? There's no other way than to try, to try and to try and to try. And for angels like you, you have 900 investments, so you have a statistically relevant, uh, you know, but most entrepreneurs and most business angels make life-changing conclusions based on one to five experiences. When it's, and that's the biggest mistake I think people make. There's so many angels that start investing, make five investments, ten investments, and then in year three, the first companies start dying and they say, I'm just a bad investor. I'm not good at this. I'm not a good entrepreneur. I'm not... Like, there's so many people right now make having heart attacks because they think they are not good enough. They think it's their fault. They think they are defected. They have not achieved. They have lost money. But in reality, in the big laws of physics, actually nothing happened. It was just an attempt. And it was a good attempt. It had option value. So I think that, that is my, you know, at the moment I feel so bad for a lot of people who are struggling. And I just wish that nobody makes any conclusions. Don't make any conclusions until you have lost one billion. If you have lost one billion, you can make some conclusions. <laughs> so we'll see what SBF thinks and what lessons he's learned from losing whatever 20 billion in the last few days. Uh, I mean, that, that I mean, 
That, that's the kind of failure yeah. that uh, that really means something. Like a lot of times, I invest in. Fun, I, I I have so much it, it failed investors where I invest again. Yeah. I do it all the time. Like I invested day bet in Australia. I, the the guy mm. failed the company before, and I do that all the time, unless there's fraud, like ethical values, like uh, using your clients' money is. Is the it's the worst. It's a sin. It's a sin. Totally agree. Like the, it's the top. Using your investors' money, money, using your clients' money, <laughs> you should never do that for personal versus. And so, if you do something illegal, you're banned. We'll never work with you again. But you're right. Most fa- many of the founders who've been successful, we had backed in their first or second company and they failed, and we backed them again because they didn't do anything wrong. The market wasn't there. The product market fit was it didn't exist. The unit economics would turn out. The market was smaller than we thought it would be. And to your point, they created option value. And by the way, now they've learned lessons. They've learned lessons on how to be better founders and with other people's money and partly ours. Uh, and so actually, yeah, backing failed prior founders is an amazing thing. They, they went to school, right? Like a startup school ideally in someone else's dime and now we get to back them and they're going to try it again and this time they're going to do it right. Yeah, I actually did an analysis, Fabrice, like you, I like to analyze. So I took all my failed stories, 50 of them, and I took all my success stories and I tried to find what is the, what what is the, like yeah. my, my neural network tried to find some correlations and I looked at, and you know, I found the founders are exactly the same. Exactly. Yeah. The, there, there's no difference. There's no yeah, difference. Exactly. I totally agree. Um, I need to run uh, in the next few minutes. So is there anything we didn't cover yet that we you want to mention or say or or point out? You know, uh, talking about unicorns, I can start now and I can keep going for 48 hours nonstop, you know. It's just uh, these these stories are so rare and they are so beautiful. And it's such I'm so grateful to be part of even one any story. You know, it's so valuable, you know, so I just wish uh, to end this podcast. And thank you so much for this. I just wish everyone to experience this, you know, extraordinary stories that we will remember for the rest of our lives. Beautiful last words to end on. Thank you, Oscar, for being on the show. Thank you for sharing all your experiences. And uh, and I look forward to having you again, I'm sure, in the in the next few years and hearing about all the great, amazing adventures uh, that you're going to be on, both professional with more unicorns and, uh, and the life unicorns, uh, starting with uh, Northern Lights with your children in the next week, which sounds beautiful and amazing as well. Thank you so Thank much, you. Fabrice. Thank you so much. And you're a big inspiration to me. You know? <laughs> well, thank you for that as well.